everyone to the Newburyport Literary Festival. My name is Jennifer Entwistle and I'm the festival co-director. We're in our 17th year of uh, bringing authors and readers together and this is our third virtual year. I wanna introduce our speakers. Um, Lily King is the award-winning author of five novels, including Euphoria, which won the Kirkus Award, the New England Book Award, and was a finalist for the National Book Critics Award. Her most recent novel is The Amazing Writers and Lovers, but we're here today to talk about her first collection of short stories, Five Tuesdays in Winter. And joining her is Heidi Pittler. She is the author of the novels The Birthdays, The Daylight Marriage, which was optioned for film, and Impersonation. She's a former senior editor at Houghton Mifflin Har Harcourt and has been the series editor of the Best American Short Stories since 2007. She is also the editor, editorial director of the literary studio Plimpton and an executive editor at Verto Literary. She lives outside Boston. So Heidi and Lily, thank you for joining us. And Heidi, I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Jennifer. I wish we could all be in beautiful Newburyport, um, but thanks all for being here. Welcome, Lily. It's wonderful to have you. So nice to be here. So good um, to see you. It's wonderful to see you too. And you know, this is our second Zoom event together. So hopefully one day we will <laughs> share <laughs> some news. I hope um, so. I know, me too. Um, I just, you know, we're here to talk about Lily's really gorgeous collection, Five Tuesdays in Winter. Um, I wanted to start by reading um, a little clip of a really terrific New York Times uh, review of it and then ask you to read about a page and then I will ply you with questions and um, we would love to take your questions and that will be it. Um, so this is from the New York Times. Uh, they said, so King knows that what we call coming of age doesn't happen in a single electric moment at age 14, but that part of being human is to keep discovering in our seasons of euphoria and sorrow, new corners of being. In our time of anxiety and isolation, King writes stories to curl up in, by which I mean they afford us something rarely celebrated in literature, comfort. And that was my um, reaction to reading this book. I read a lot of stories. Um, there's a lot of very anxious stories out there, experimental stories. These stories just feel so lovely and I, I, I hate using this term because it's pejorative, but old fashioned in the best way of sort of just, you know, really plumbing deep into characters and moments and amplifying them, which is my favorite kind of story to read. Um, Lily, can you, uh, can you actually tell us a, a little bit an overview of the collection and read us a page? Let's start with that. Sure. Um, you know, it's interesting about comfort um, just because, you know, if I, if you actually went down the, the list of stories, you know, the first one is about a teenage girl being molested. The next one is about somebody, you know, kind of, um, very, very, very repressed to the point of not being able to find love. You know, I, I can just go through them. I mean, yeah. you know, there's more sexual abuse. There's yeah. somebody in a coma. There's, um, you know. <laughs> there's and that's what uh, we find like comforting these days just I know. and uh, so it is Lovely. funny but I I think I've heard that before and I I guess um I guess it's a little bit about uh perhaps identifying you know um that it's comforting um when you can identify with those emotions I mean really what I'm interested in is the emotional arc and and so I, I, I feel like I'm trying to bring the reader on this emotional journey. And, and even though that journey is hard and it doesn't always end in a nice shiny bow of a happy ending, I, I, I think maybe the comfort is just like connecting with, with hard times or connecting with moments of joy and revelation and discovery. I mean, that's, what, that's, what I, that, that's how I'm gonna take that comment. <laughs> Because I don't feel like they're light, you know what I mean? They're 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 hard. I mean, they're hard. I, I'm not. I don't know. It's not certainly not kind of smooth sailing. You know, I, so I began because so I felt really comforted by this, and it's true. The content might not be comforting, but there's something comforting in being in hands, you know, artistic hands that are very sure and are articulate. And so there's something about someone who is able to nail language and sort of say, here's a really out of control moment. 
but you're you're lassoing it with your language. And so you do that wonderfully in this book. No, oh, thank you. Thank you. Well, it's it, there. It's a collection of to, in, to try to introduce it. It's a, a collection of 10 stories. Um, I had a, I have a lot more stories, but we really my editor and I decided to, to just make it a, a kind of a smaller, more curated um, instead of doing all of them. And, um, and these were kind of, you know, probably my favorites, I would say. And I have a few other favorites, but they're not quite finished. And it was COVID and uh, I was having a hard time focusing. So I really had to, to um, just, you know, deal with, with the ones that I felt were at a, at a really good place. Um, and, and they really, they really span, um, they're, they're men and they're women and they're young and they're old and um, they, you know, come from different, many different backgrounds and uh, I, I uh, as I said, you know, it's hard, it's hard to sum up. Let believe me, every year I have to sum up yeah. a collection of short stories. It's oh hard. yes, you do. <laughs> oh yeah, it's very hard. And More I, I have a few story. little stock from here to here to there or you yeah. Know. It's but we really, my editor and I worked really hard on, on trying to make, you know, when you turn the page and you start a new story, you know, you're going into a very different world. You know, we really tried to, try to make everyone its own, you know, um, in individual self. And there, cause there are three short, there are three stories in here that have, um, female narrators, first person narrators who, eventually become writers. So we separated those out and there we kind of think of them as the three pillars of the of the collection, you know, in some way because there are different stages of becoming a writer. And it's funny because I wrote these all before I wrote Writers and Lovers. Um, and so I feel like that was a little bit of like my training ground and my practice ground. I didn't know that that I had a whole novel in me about about a writer, but um, I kept on gravitating, you know, I, I like the creature, you know, she's 14 years old and, and there's this moment where she says, you know, um, that she kind of comes into her own as a writer writing letters to her friend from this babysitter, live in babysitting job. And at one point, you know, she says she feels like a writer, which is eventually what I became, you know, and that was such a surprise to me. I didn't know that I was actually going to write that until that sentence was on the page. And I was like, oh, okay, this is, this is kind of like a, you know, a building's Roman or whatever, you know, this is how she got her start. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I feel like we could just keep talking. To, yeah, no, it's so interesting. I, I think it's, there's so many rules in writing and one of them is don't write about writing. And I'm a big fan of throwing those rules away. Um, you write into what you have the energy to explore and where yeah. there's where there's conflict and energy and interest. And um, that story in particular with the young girl who's sort of learning again to give words to moments that feel bigger um you know she's learning the thing that is a part of how we control life and understand it is by naming certain things um yeah. so anyway so let's have you read a page okay i'm gonna read from um when in the door done oh, great. Uh, which uh yeah so i'm just gonna show you because my daughter did a little drawings um, under under each of the title uh, pages, and they're just so cute. They're just I just love the little drawing so much. It's very hard to see what that is, but anyway, um, it's a little it's a little 1980s era um, sock uh, that we used to call peds. I know oh. they don't call them peds anymore, but it has that little ball right there. Oh yes, uh, it's a little pom -pom. To, you know to keep your socks from sinking down under your sneaker. So anyway. Um, when in the door done. The summer of 1986, the summer before I entered high school, my parents went to the Dordon for eight weeks. My father had been sick and it was thought that France, where he'd studied as a young man, would enable his recovery. I'm just going to pause and say this is a, a, a male narrator. You don't find that out for a few pages, so I'll just tell you that right up. Um, through the university's employment office, my mother hired two sophomores to house it for the time that they would be out of the country. As I came with the house, these two college boys were obligated to take care of me too. 
We lived at the end of a short street in a quiet neighborhood. Our house was big and gray, exceptionally large for three people, though I didn't realize that until Ed and Grant arrived in a maroon Pontiac that first afternoon. The two boys stood responsibly beside me as we waved my parents off. Grant might have murmured something consoling as they disappeared around the corner about how they'd be back before I knew it. And then after a respectful pause, they let loose. Ed ran into the house and circled the rooms like a dog just let off its leash, climbed up the front stairs and came down the tight back stairs and then went up the front set again, whooping and whooping again, all the way to the third floor balcony where he called down to Grant and me still standing in the front hall. Just as we looked up, he released a pale green globule that landed right on Grant's cheek. Grant barely flinched, wiped it off with the bottom of his t-shirt and tore up the stairs. I could hear though on one floor, then another down across the back hallway to my father's study. I didn't tell them not to go in it, though I was screaming it in my head. And around in my sister's old rooms, my brother's old room, all of them having left before I could remember their, them ever having lived there. Their rooms still stuck in the 70s, the girls' closet doors covered with McGovern musky bumper stickers, my brothers with Nixon Agnew and Ford Rockefeller. I stood there frozen in the downstairs hallway, not with fear, but with amazement with revelation. I had only seen people behave one way in this house, prudently, laconically, in codes I could not understand, but had learned to imitate. And now here was another way. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's such a terrific story that I'm going to jump to one of my later questions and ask you this. Um, okay. I love the dialogue in this story. I read, I have weird, you know, I glom onto certain things, but it's very realistic. And, um, I love writing dialogue myself and I myself, I'm always interested in writing dialogue um, of characters that are nothing like me. Um, how do you set about doing that? For me, I, I often will go on social media and just get a few words and they get me thinking in a different way or, you know, oh, that's weird, interesting. weird sources, but how do you find yourself, these two characters, the, the banter between the three of them is really wonderful. Oh, um, thank you. I just sit there and listen. I don't know. I don't really do. Uh, I don't. I don't. I can't think of of anything that I do apart from like read Virginia Woolf, read Shirley Hazard, read Elizabeth Strout. You know, yeah. uh, kind of circle around uh, those books over and over. Uh, I. I. Um, I don't know, you know, the characters come to you and if they don't come to you, they don't speak and then you don't write them. And, and when they come to you and they start speaking, the minute you have a couple of exchanges, you, you fall into their rhythm and they just yeah. keep going, you know? And um, I, I don't know, I, when it's working, it's working. And when it's not working, forget it. There's nothing you can do to make them speak, you know? No, absolutely. I, I don't, you know, I, I do think there's a certain, I know it when I see dialogue that's not working and it sort of dies on the page. Um, but when it lifts, you know, when, when, when sentences are pinging off each other, when characters are, it's, just, it's a really wonderful thing. So this story, I, I do remember that. No, from. Thank you. Um, so part of this talk is just about short stories in general. Um, your, this book, I think, contains stories that are written over a span of years. Yeah. Yeah, like 20 years. For 20 years. So how would you say your writings changed over that time? Did you have to go back and revise at all? I didn't really. I mean, we did a little bit of revision. There's a little bit of like with um, actually Five Tuesdays in Winter played around a little bit with the ending, kind of tried to make it just, you know, just a little better um, because that was kind of an older story. Uh, I think that in general, you can kind of see my no my my stories get more novelistic as they uh, yeah. as they get closer to the present. You know, the earlier ones like South is probably the earliest one, and then Waiting for Charlie, um, and then maybe Man at the Door. Uh, the the earlier ones are I would say they're they're shorter. They're they're kind of more classically story like. Mm -hmm. um, I got, after I started writing, cause I wrote short stories first for years and years, mm -hmm. um, you know, way before any of these stories were written. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and 
And then as I started writing novels, I feel like I would just, uh, I'd let myself be a little more free, a little, a little looser with the form. And, and they definitely kind of get longer. And I wouldn't say meandering, um, but they, they, they incorporate more, they embrace more. They're not, they're not as um, worried about uh, kind of throwing in stuff that you may or may not use, you know, I, I, and you end up, you do end up using it or, or, or you, you know, you toss it out, but, but I, I feel like they're more expansive um, and they're kind of, they're, for me, they're weightier, they're bigger, they're, they're um, I don't know, they're a little bit more bang for the buck for, for, from my perspective. <laughs> well, and I, I think too, I, I think back to writing earlier and it feels as if you're sort of trying to inhabit larger and larger spaces and you're more comfortable with that instead yeah. of, kind of I'm in a room and I need to fill this room and that's my first story and then you kind of go okay I can skip through time or I can bring in this character and um, I think it must be interesting to work on a book that encapsulates your own growth as a writer to some extent yeah yeah it is it's odd I mean it's all it's really I think it's very hard to judge your own work I I have a yeah um and the old work, it's even harder. I can, I can judge work that, you know, I wrote three weeks ago pretty easily, but um, the older stuff is, I don't know. It, 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 it's harder to get a purchase on it really. Yeah. It, it yeah. was you, but it's not really you. And, um, and you don't want to mess with, I didn't want to mess with it too much because, um, because it's not me anymore, you know? <laughs> right. Um, yeah. Okay, so, so book publishing is notorious for, um, or editors are notorious for preferring novels to story collections, yeah. which I roll my eyes at. Um, yeah. What made you want to publish a collection of stories? Well, uh, I suggested it many times and never really, nobody was very excited about it for a long time. And then finally, when I did the book deal with Writers and Lovers, I did a two book deal. And I was like, I'm publishing short stories, like it or not, you got to take this too. And, uh, and so that's, that's how I did it. And it's funny because it, it, these, these have been, these have been rocky years for everybody, right? The last two years. And, and they've been, um, they've been rocky for our, our family because my daughter has been sick for a year and a half and not, not, um, not with cancer, not with, not with something life-threatening, but every day ill, you know, <laughs> and uh, uh, I have written so little. And, and so I proposed um, a little while ago, an essay collection. <laughs> and it turns out, I always thought that, you know, there was, I, I always kind of thought there's nonfiction, right? So there's nonfiction book, and then there are essays, and then there's fiction, and then there are short stories, or, you know, then there's novels, and then there's short stories. No, it turns out nobody wants your essay collection either. <laughs> I know it's it's I will reserve judgment but um it, you know book publishing is they're very there's a bit of a backward looking you know this is what's worked in the past we don't want to push this um and I will you know as a as a big fan of genre flexibility I, it it I find that a little depressing yeah um, here's a yeah. random question. yeah it's all about sales. Apparently, yeah. essays don't sell, which is really funny because I feel like there have been so many big essay collections, but then it turns out that, sure you know, not. I'm one of a few who are buying it and making it big, you know? <laughs> well, and I think it, it's a chicken and the egg thing. If you're not going to market it, it's not going to sell. And, you know, right. yeah, um, exactly. Think, yes. Um, yeah. Okay. So in your acknowledgments, you thank your high school English teacher um, yeah. for teaching you about stories. What stories did you read then? And what did this person teach you? Yeah, so he was Mr. Paulus in uh, Hamilton, Massachusetts, where I went to high school. And, you know, I have to say, it was heavy, heavy, heavy dose of white men back, okay, back when I was mind. educated. And uh, <laughs> so we read, um, you know, D.H. Lawrence, The Rocking Horse Winner. Okay. We read a lot of Updike. Updike was just down the road from us oh, right away. And, uh, and my teacher was very enamored with him. Um, and so we read a lot of Updike and I really loved Updike. We read the, the novel, The Centaur, um, but the tons of short stories, you know, particularly the A&P and, P and um, Pigeon Feathers. Um, we weren't doing the maple. I, he, he veered, you know, he had to veer away from all the, 
the sexual stories, which I discovered later. Um, so we did more of the kind of younger boy narrator stories. Um, and who else? Uh, there was there was one Flannery Connor, and there was one Eudora Welty, and there was one Catherine Porter, Catherine Ann Porter, and um, uh, definitely J.D. Salinger. We I think we read the whole the whole um, nine stories, which I was completely yeah. enamored with. I'd read Catcher in the Rye in eighth grade, but nine stories probably was the biggest biggest thing for me in high school. I feel like that too. I feel like everyone goes to Catcher in the Rye, but what kids really fall in love with. Franny yeah. Zoe, the Glass family. It, it's just, yeah, his stories yeah. are sort of magic when you're a kid. Yeah, um, no, that's really true. And maybe, you know, maybe that has a gender thing to it. Maybe. I don't know. It does seem like like my girls, you know, my daughters really, really love the short stories. That's funny. Um, so what did you learn about story writing then? Or did you, do you remember this? Yeah, I mean, I took creative writing in high school for two semesters wow. with him. Wow. Um, and his big thing was write what you know, write what you know. And, and I definitely remember when I first got into that class, uh, you know, my first story was an epistolary short story, which is not maybe great for the form. And, and it was about somebody like living in a log cabin in the, you know, the West or the Midwest. <laughs> and it was a total, you know, uh, Little House on the Prairie ripoff. Nice. Um, and uh, so he, they, you know, I was deeply mocked by the seniors in the class because it was a junior senior class right. and I was a junior. Um, and then, you know, so I really started just writing really what I knew, like quite autobiographical stuff, which I kind of had to veer away from when I got to college because I, I didn't really want to be exposing my family like that, really, you know. Uh, and so I had to, to figure out other things to write about. Um, and, and in high school, I don't think I was, I just wasn't brave enough to be really writing what I knew because I didn't feel like I knew it. I mean, but I was witnessing a lot of stuff, you know, in my very broken and very strange family that I was not writing about that I probably should have been writing about. Um, and, and so I feel like my stories were, were pretty superficial in high school, but, but he was, we had to deliver a three and a half page full complete you know, beginning, middle, ending short story on his desk every Monday morning from January to June. So um, it was a really, really, really good practice. Yeah, I mean, those are some of the greatest classes you can have. Almost just yeah. write anything a lot. Get, yes. To get going to realize you can do it. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's so interesting. Um, yeah. So we talked a little bit, and this is, I feel like a good question after the last one. There is some sexual violence in this book. Mm -hmm. um, is that tough for you to write or does it come as a logical extension of your exploration of gender and emotion? Does it sort of come or do you? It isn't tough for me to write, which is a little worrisome maybe, <laughs> but it just happens, you know, like I, I did not know, for example, at Cre with Creature that that's where we were going. I just, I didn't know that. I had these characters and they, you know, the hue arrived and, you know, and then it just kind of went that way. Um, and it, it felt, it felt like the natural course of events, you know, unfortunately. Um, and, uh, I, I definitely just turn into a technician when I'm doing stuff like that. I, I, I don't think I'm, I'm very emotionally invested in the moment when I'm first writing it. I'm just, you know, as you know, you know, you're, you're orchestrating so much, you know, you're doing the dialogue and the setting and the movements and the, you know, I don't know, it's very, it's very hard with the first draft um, to get everything kind of moving just right. And, um, and I'm often, I'm sort of, I'm often at an emotional remove. And I find with a lot of what I write, the emotion comes at the end, you know, yeah. sometimes it comes, you know, uh, many drafts into it, or sometimes it comes at the very end of the first draft where, 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 where I suddenly I let, I let myself feel these things that I haven't, that I've kind of held back because I think if I started, you know, getting weeping and getting too emotionally wrought by it, I, I might not finish it. <laughs> 
Right, right. No, and, and you have to, I mean, your eye has to be on the story and the characters. It's sort yeah. of, as an observer, you, you know, it, it's an interesting, it's an interesting thing. I have one more question and then I will open it up to the, I see there's some questions here. Um, so people tending to children is a theme for you. Um, what does this yeah. offer you narratively? Yeah, it really is interesting. And I, I, uh, I guess, I guess I do have it in some of my novels too. Um, I was a babysitter for so many years <laughs> that, uh, that it, it's not just that I'm a mother. Um, it, it, it was definitely, um, I mean, I, my parents divorced when I was 11. They each remarried. They had younger kids. I mean, they didn't have them themselves. They had, they, they, were, they had spouses who had younger kids. Um, and then I started babysitting for everyone in the neighborhood, you know, by age 13. And my last babysitting job, I think I was like 32. <laughs> so, so I did it a lot. Yeah. that waitressing um and it, it just children walk into those stories you know yeah. uh i i love writing about children yeah uh i love what they offer and you know they 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 sometimes they're just seeing the world so clear-eyed uh and they cut through a lot of bullshit and um and and they're so vulnerable and they're so um i don't know as a reader i think you're you know you're you're so moved when they're well taken care of and you're um you're so moved in another way when 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 they aren't and I, it's not that i'm thinking oh i'm going to manipulate the reader in this way <laughs> but but i for whatever reason i uh it it it, it, they really uh, help you hit your emotional notes, you know? Yeah, I think too, I think there's a bit, and I think this is a beautiful thing. It's another word that gets misused, but there's a kind of nostalgia for that simplicity. And there's a, there's a pureness of that psychology of children and then a slightly older child being put in that parental role that I think yeah. you're really good at exploring and kind of the vulnerability of both the child and the person tending the children and kind of. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, so That's let's good. answer some questions here. Okay. Um, so Claire asks, do you see a thread that connects all the stories? Mm. Um, no, I think my editor really would have liked one. <laughs> I think, you know, everybody wishes for you that for resisting that, that though, you know, so, that can feel so artificial and good for you for just letting stories be stories. Yeah. I mean, but in terms of a thread, I mean, I, I know you're not meaning, um, uh, like, you know, kind of connected short stories, but, but thematically, yeah. uh, I'm so bad at seeing my work thematically, to be honest with you. Uh, I, I do, I do, I think yeah. that I'm interested in putting people in sort of perilous situations and how can they get out of them? <laughs> you know, and I also, I often put people in very claustrophobic situations oh, um, that, you know, a lot. That's probably, that's probably the hugest theme of all of my work is just trying to get people into like a little pressure cooker of an environment and, yeah. and, and compress and compress and see what happens. So I, I, I think that would probably be it. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, okay, next question. Elizabeth says, I loved the story when in Dordon about the boy who oops, is taken care of by the two college students for the summer. That story gave me comfort. And more than that, it gave me faith in humanity or at least a feeling that you, the author, have faith in humanity, do you? Oh, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> I do. I definitely, definitely have faith in humanity. I just, I don't think I would be a writer otherwise. I, I would have no interest in, you know, proclaiming that we're all screwed. <laughs> you know, um, I do. I, I, I think um, I, I'm so still sort of enraptured with the way he, people can be generous to each other and the way people surprise each other and love each other. And 
um, are loyal to each other. Uh, I, I find a lot of a lot of comfort in that. I have to say, uh, and and that story in particular, a lot of people, and I didn't expect this. I wasn't even thinking this. A lot of people thought that that story was going to be an abuse story, and that yeah. that those boys were going to be bad and harmful to that that younger boy. And um, I knew where we were going with it, and I knew that that wasn't the case. But um, so a lot of people said, "Oh, it was just so nice to see boys or young men being kind and generous and nurturing." You know, which I I hadn't really thought about that. And I will just say, as an aside. I got that story at a pizza place right down the road from here. Um, when I was with uh, many years ago, when I was with my little girls, I mean, they were probably like six and eight at the time, and now they're 21 and 23. And we were uh, having pizza, and I ran into a man uh, my age who I, I hadn't seen probably since I was 16 or 17 years old. And I knew him for a few summers, and that was it. And I didn't know him all that well. And, and we recognized each other and we spoke really briefly, like a few minutes. But he said that sentence that I read um, at the beginning of When in the Dodon, he said, oh yeah, when I was a teenager, my parents went to Europe for the summer or that he said they went away from the summer or something. And, um, and my mother got two college kids to take care of the house. And because I took care of the house, I, they had to take care of me too. And I remember logging that away and I didn't use it for years, but, um, but I just thought it, that, that's the kind of sentence I just love, you know, it had kind of um, some emotional benign or not neglect and it had some humor and it had um, the possibility of come, some class conflict, you know, privilege and non-privilege. And I was really like, it had everything in it. So he said that and I, I knew I would write about that someday. And then, and then I did. And those boys just, I mean, I didn't, he never said they were so nice and nurturing and sweet and it was the best summer of my life by any means. Um, but I don't know. I just knew that, that I liked those boys and that they were going to be good. Yeah, no, it's wonderful. I mean, I've, I've read again, so many short stories and there is a thing where short stories kind of peter off into the non-ending, which was, it has been a thing for a long time. And I've just become such a fan of the definitive ending and also dare I say the happy ending because it's rare it's hard to do but when it's done well and I don't want to I'm not going to say anything about this story it's so rewarding like in that way of, as when you're 10 and reading and you think ta-da and you read something uh, and you're 10 inside still and they're still you know yeah it's it's, yeah. it's really I think it's one of the boldest things that a writer can do is really end something and, 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 you know, not on the cheesy, hopeful note that is that your publisher wants you to end, but find the organic moment, the glimmer of, okay, you know, maybe it's, that's all I will say. I don't want to say, yeah. give away too much. Yeah, um, so Katz says, um, it seems, so we have a long question here. I'm going to maybe right. see if we can break it down a bit. It seems that a lot of the stories were set in the late seventies and eighties. Was this accidental because you wrote these stories over a couple decades? And then the characters' ages matched your own experiences, or did you require them to be set back then to make certain elements work, like no mobile phones, et cetera? Mm -hmm. It just kind of happened. I think probably it 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 has to do with my age and my memories, and um, I'm always in my writing, you know, a few decades behind. You know, I don't I don't yeah. process things quickly. I don't write about where I live now. I'm always writing about where I lived, you know, 20 or 30 years ago. Um, I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I haven't, I mean, I barely, you know, had a cell phone in a story um, yet. Uh, and, and I, I think I'm going to, I'm really, this new novel that I'm writing, there are cell phones, it's set in 2020, but it's a stretch for me. It's a stretch for me to get into the 21st century. But, um, but I, I, I am trying. Um, yeah. yeah, it's kind of where I, where I feel comfortable, you know? Yeah, yeah no, I, it makes sense. I, I mean, computers and cell phones dramatically change a plot. <laughs> Plausibility yeah. becomes, it, it dramatically changes yeah. things. Um, the other part of this question is, um, is North Sea set on the island of Wangaroog? Um, you know? Uh, it's a really good question. Okay. To be honest, I can't remember. 
that's fine. I, and I, I, I think it's kind of an amalgam. I, I, I yeah. did a whole study, I like study, a Google search um, yeah. for days and days about the various islands, German owned islands on the North Sea. And, um, and I took some of this and some of that, and then I made up a lot of it. Um, and, but I, I think I did have one island in mind, but it, I, it wasn't, it wasn't that one. Okay. Um, okay. So I'm sorry. That's okay. It's, it's no. no, that's fine. Um, okay. And the next question is by Jonna. Um, I love that you mentioned Virginia Woolf. Mm -hmm. Elizabeth Strout did as well. Could you share your favorite by her or even just what you love about her? I think my favorite writer, my favorite writers all love Virginia. I love her too. So. Yeah. Yeah, well, I always have um, To the Lighthouse on my desk. Yeah. Uh, so that is definitely my favorite. Um, I do love Mrs. Dalloway, of course. Um, I, I, love, I love so much of her work, but I do think that the To the Lighthouse is really, I can just pick that up and that's why I have it on my desk. I could pick it up anywhere, anytime, you know any moment of that book and uh and it just reminds me what good writing is and how much i love it the thing that kind of depresses me about to the lighthouse is that you know i've read her diaries or a lot of her diaries and she just um that that book just flew out of her you know it it just poured out of her in this way that nothing ever had and and uh, that's never happened to me. <laughs> and I just want that to happen to me so badly. Um, so it's not like she slogged and she slogged like we all do. And uh, and then but then suddenly it was brilliant. Like I think she knew every day that she was working on it that it was brilliant. Yeah. Um, so and it's so it just breaks every rule. It's such I have it on my desk too. And in fact, I love it so much that I stuck uh, you know a couple sentences of it again and again in my last book. Um, <laughs> you know, it's um, yeah, it's a magical book, and it it's every time you read it, you get something different from it. I find. Yes, yeah, no, that is just very 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 true. Unbelievable. Okay, your next question. Um, I love that your daughter did the pictures at the start of each story. I felt like they were little hidden Easter yeah. eggs with each story. What was the photo with the timeline? It drove me crazy that I couldn't figure it out. And P.S. I loved the book from Christina. Okay, well, I'm just gonna have to flip to that. I know. Uh, <laughs> I, I I'm blanking. Uh, oh, it's the it's a non uh, It's the candy that they that. Oh. And they have at the at the candy factory that they go to. She goes on a date, and they go to a candy factory. Oh, wow. oh so you can, yeah, it's kind of hard to see. Uh, unfortunately, you know, it's it's hard with the printing. It was not she. She actually did it not on paper, but on an iPad, and it looked really, really good. And then it was for some reason the the program just didn't have the pixels to to make it look as good on the page as it did on the iPad. So live and learn on that one. But she, my, my daughter's the one who, who came up with this idea because she had done the geese um, for writers and lovers. Oh, and, uh, yeah. and she had had that idea too. And then, and then she said, maybe I'll do it. Maybe I should do a little drawing for every story. And first I was like, oh, I don't know. Like, you know when, what do you do? Then you say, okay. I know, and she's my daughter. And, yeah. and I just love them so much. Oh, it's amazing. That is amazing. It, it's, it's, it's such a lovely thing to have. I know. One of my um, favorites is this one, the flippers. Love that. So oh. <laughs> that's, 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 that's for me is the seventies right there. You know? Yes, it is that it, well, that and the kids with the pom-poms, man. Yeah. 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 Me back. Um, Marianne. Hi, Marianne says, I love your writing. Can you talk a little more about your process? Do you outline more for a novel than for a short story or do you outline at all, even in your head? I do, I, I do, I do outline not usually for a short story, short stories, they just, they just kind of come out of me. I have little notes in the margins of the, of the pages that I'm working on. Mm -hmm. I rarely even have, I, sometimes I have like a scrap of an envelope or a receipt or something where I got the first idea and I carry that with me, but um, usually short, short stories just kind of take off. Um, novels are different. You know, I, I start with the scraps of paper um, but then, then I really, I try to make a timeline. And so I, I write, I like a draw a line across a page and then I, 
I write like little things that could happen. That that's kind of visually how I how I do a novel. But right. but another big thing that I do with novels is um, usually with the like three main characters or something. I will do a um, an autobiography and that not, doesn't make it into the um, into the novel, but it's just a separate file. And I always start. I was born, and it's always in first person, and it's about even even if it's not a first person book or, uh, you know, that, that character is not told in the first person. Um, and I just write their story, you know, and I try to be in their voice, really inhabit their voice and their memories. And it, cause so it just gets me, it, it just gets me so much closer to them. And I understand um, a lot of their motivations and their backstory. And a lot of it does come into the novel in, in some way or another. That's what really helped me with euphoria. I was really stumped with that book until I, wrote the three of their autobiographies and then then I knew who they were and it was so helpful yeah that it, there's that moment of I got it I think you know I can't I can't something's fuzzy something fuzzy. Yeah. it's a great it's one of those yeah great yeah movies. and the novel I'm working on right now I, I'm only halfway through the first character's autobiography I have 70 pages of the novel but there's a guy and I'm really stumped with him. And I just, I need, I know what I need to do. I need to go in and write his autobiography and, and then I will know him. Yeah. I don't know him yet. Interesting. Can you tell us anything about this book? Or is it too soon? There is a dead body on the first page and I don't oh. know who it is and I don't know who killed that person. That's funny. I hope <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm already 70 pages in and I don't know. So it's a little worrisome. Dang. And I hope that they make it through final draft, this dead body. Sometimes, you know. How I, true. But let's we'll we'll be gunning for the dead body to stay. You know, I had a dead body at the end of Euphoria. Yes, you did. Actually. I loved it so. I loved having a dead body so much. The best. It's the best. Right? You know, it really you really don't have to write a worry about the beauty of every sentence when you have a dead body on the page. No, so. it's really it's, it's a lovely thing. A dead body is a great thing, uh, especially an unidentified dead body. Um, I am skipping some of these questions because I just want to give everyone a chance to ask them. Um, and some of them are repeat askers and great questions, but we're trying to give everyone a chance. So Lisa says, I love your book so much. Thank you. I wonder if you have any advice for writers who are also mothers of young children. I am pandemic parenting a toddler and finding it so hard to make time to write. Any words of advice? Oh, good. I'm so glad you're writing that there because I just, just the second saw that in the chat. Yeah, in the, um, exactly. I was like, oh, I, know, I can't talk and type at the same time. I'm hopeless. It's a lot. With that. hopeless. <laughs> so thank you, Lisa. Um, I would say, um, I real. I mean, my my very, very, very hardest times as a young writer, apart from like the very beginning, you know, in my 20s was when I had young children and I had already written and published a novel, but the very young children part when they're not going to school yet, I was, I was so close to giving it up. I was just so like, okay, I'm just gonna stop until they go to school. Um, and I, uh, I remember so well having that thought, thinking that's what I should do. And then I went to a little gathering of um, some friends. We had just moved to Maine and um, somebody invited us over. So they were all new people. And I met an artist, um, Grace DeGenero, and she lives in Yarmouth, Maine still. Um, and she had a high school kid at the time and maybe, maybe an older child too. And I said that I was thinking about just giving it up until they go to school. And she said, you know, just keep your foot in the door. Just, just write as, you know, if you, 15 minutes, you know, every few days, like just keep your foot in the door so that when you go back, you know, it's not going to be unfamiliar. And, and that was the best advice. I hung on to that. And I'm like, I'm just keeping the foot in the door. I'm just, yeah. I'm not, I'm not going to quit, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and, and quitting was making me unhappy. I mean, I just even thinking about it, it, it just, so I, I would just say, just take whatever time you can, even if it's tiny, just keep your foot in the door. Yeah. Um, okay. Can, do I have time for two more quick ones? Yeah, if that's fine with me. Um, so yes, if you're okay. okay. I just want to get these two last people in here. Sure. 
Um, Anonymous says, do you ever deliberately use short story writing as a tool to work out characters or themes or scenes for your novels? Or no, do you just write short stories because you want to? Yeah, I never, I've never, as far as I know, had any kind of overlap. There, when I get an idea, I, I pretty much know very quickly, if not in that very moment, if it's a short story or a novel um, or, a, or a, like a personal essay or something. Um, I just, uh, I don't know. The short story idea is just, it's, it is, it's just, it's smaller and it, and it just, it comes contained, you know, it comes in its little jar and the novel is like, it's so funny, my reaction to them too, you know, when I, when I get a short story idea, I'm like, oh, fun. And when I get a novel idea, I'm like, oh, I like fall back on the floor. Like, oh my God, that's going to be, that's too much. That's way too much. No, no, no. That would require so much research. That would require, you know, that would require years. No, I can't do it. Um, and so I know when I have a, I can't do that idea. That's a novel. <laughs> but a short story feels more manageable. More manageable. Okay, your final question. This is a great question. I've read your novels. This is Juliana. Um, I've read your novels, which are so very different and look forward to reading your stories. My question is what contemporary short story writer or specific stories do you admire? Oh, that's great. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I, re I Elizabeth Stroud again, like I just, I, um, I think she is writing really incredible short stories and her, her kind of novella, short novel, um, My Name is Lucy Barton is just really, really, really one of my favorite works of all time. Um, uh, I, I mean, I love Alice Munro um, very much. And I, I uh, um, I'm just now, I'm reading um, Brandon Taylor's uh, Filthy Animals. And I just think it's really, really, really good. And I'm, I feel like I'm a little behind in my very contemporary short stories. Um, I will send you a Washington couple of collections. I loved the collection. Is that what it's called? Washington Black? Am I making that up? Oh, this is uh, Friday Black? Friday yes. Black. Yes. Sorry. And yes, Sorry. Brian Washington is another Thank great you. One. Yeah, okay. Also, yeah. <laughs> Brian Washington <laughs> is a great one too. Yeah. But I will send you a Best American Short Story so you can get up to speed. Oh, please do. God, I would love that. Well, you're, yeah, I just, I love that every year. Don't miss it. Fantastic. Um, oh, also I loved, so, I mean, I'm, I'm a huge fan of um, Elif Batuman. Am I pronouncing that right? I think uh, so. Huge fan. And yeah. the latest story in the New Yorker is an excerpt from the novel, but it is so good. I loved it so much. I was just like, just all on fire, you know, and I really love something. I'm just constantly getting ideas and taking notes. And I was just in heaven reading that story. So. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Jennifer. This was really fun. Thank well, you. Well, actually, before we wrap, I have my own question. I wanted to ask you, do you uh, select the order of the short stories in the book or is an editor putting that together? Like how, how does the sequencing done? Yeah, my editor and I worked on that um, and we gave each other different, you know, she'd make a list, I'd make a list, she'd make a list. And we just kind of, you know, we're always on the same page. So it's not remotely antagonistic or anything. It was just kind of trying to figure out what felt kind of like the most natural flow. And we did realize that, that, that um, you know, it slowly goes into a little bit of surreal, you know, starting with Mansard and then going to South and then ending with Man at the Door. And that was kind of an interesting, yeah. Thing. But now I have a question for Heidi, which is who are your favorite contemporary short story writers? I are know, you allowed to say <laughs> my favorite children? But no, I, you know, I thought of this and I, I, I actually did a little, I wrote down a few before because I can never remember these on the spot, but I am going to plug some people who I think have new books out and who are really, really wonderful. Lee Newman, if anyone knows who she is, is unbelievable. An Alaskan writer has a new book out. <laughs> Carmen Maria Mikado is incredibly great. And these are all, I think, just new on fire, really, you know, unique writers. Um, Jamel Brinkley is a young writer and Brian Washington, who you mentioned before. Yeah. Lauren Groff writes amazing short stories. 
Um, Kevin Wilson writes some of my favorite short stories. I mean, I shouldn't say my favorite. There, I have so many favorites. You know, every year I get to pick 120 and pass them along. To yeah. people. Um, there's a lot of really wonderful story writers out there. Um, so buy Best American Short Stories yes. in addition to Lily's book uh -huh. because we all have time for stories. We don't always have time or energy for novels sometimes, but. Yeah, no, it's so true. I have to recommend another one now, Francesca yeah. Marciano. I oh, love right. her right. stuff so much. I, I highly recommend getting that. <laughs> and Emma Klein, that's one more. Emma Klein. Oh, a, yes, yes. Daddy is a great book. So. Okay. Oh, wow. All right, so everybody's TBR is now a yeah. mile long. <laughs> Go to your independent bookstore and get all these books. Um, thank you so much. And you know, one of the benefits of being the co-director is I'm like, I am letting this go long. <laughs> I don't want it to end, but I, I do want to be, uh, you know, cognizant of your time. So thank you so much. I mean, this was a really fantastic discussion. Um, I, I loved this book. Uh, so I hope, I'm sure if you, if the audience has not read it, please run out and get this. This is a, just such an amazing book of short stories. <laughs> so uh, Lily and Heidi, you're always so generous. Uh, thank you so much from the festival because you, you are festival favorites. You know, we'd love to have you. We both said this is one of our favorite festivals. <laughs> so thank Next you. Next time in person. Absolutely. Yes, we need to get you in town. So yes. uh, to the audience, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you all, thank you. Thanks so much, Heidi. Thanks, Jen. Thank you, Lily. <laughs> Bye. Bye.